Hi guys, welcome to our daily encounter. Yesterday we considered our new experience in Christ through our dying with Christ in baptism. We have, as it were, stepped into a new realm, a new way of existence, of reality, through our being in, uh, clothed with Christ and put into Christ. Just as the Israelites were brought into a new sphere of reality as they left Egypt and entered into a covenantal relationship with God at Mount Sinai in the wilderness. And so the point was that we should no longer allow sin to reign in our lives because we have stepped out of the realm of sin to then be brought into the realm of Christ. Sin is no longer to be a master over us anymore because we are now in Christ. And there's basically four practical ways that we make this effective in our lives as found in chapter six, to know, to consider, to do not let, and to present. Uh, he says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. The first thing is to actually know, to know that, you know, when I, when I was buried with Christ in baptism, my old self was crucified with him, was put to death. If we don't know that, then it might be that these things don't have a practical influence in our lives. But then also to consider, he says, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's how we uh, lay hold of the fact that this is true. We reckon this to be true, that ourselves are, that we are dead to sin, but we're alive to God in Christ Jesus. In other words, we're out of the sphere of sin, and now we're in the sphere of God, of God in Christ Jesus, of, of life in God in Christ Jesus. And then do not let shows that there is there is a, a place for the will to be exerted in this process as well. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its lust. And what's implied there is that if sin is reigning in our bodies and we are obeying its lust, it's because we let it. Uh, we are no longer in the sphere of sin. And if sin is touching our lives and it is beginning to take precedence over our lives, it's because we're letting it do so. And that's a very important point to remember. And then present ourselves is the last step. No longer presenting ourselves or our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So we present ourselves to God like the Israelites used to present their offering to God. We present our bodies to God uh, as instruments of righteousness for him to utilize and to uh, use for his good pleasure. And so we got to know that we've been crucified. We got to consider or reckon ourselves as dead to sin. We have to not let rain, uh, sin reign in our bodies. And we need to present our bodies to God. And as we do that, the, the reality of this new sphere, the reality of the fact that we've been brought out of the sphere of sin will become more and more apparent in our lives. And that leads us to chapter 7, because the more and more we experience death to self and death to the body of sin, and the more and more we're presenting ourselves or our members as instruments of righteousness to God, that changes our relationship with the law. And that's kind of what chapter 7 is all about. Oftentimes we think that chapter 7 is this whole new subject that Paul's bringing up. He was talking about uh, our baptism and not sinning. And then all of a sudden now in chapter 7, he, he takes a turn and he's talking about something totally different about the law and the difficulty of trying to keep the law. It all runs together. As a matter of fact, verse 1 says, Or do you not know, brethren? As though he's continuing the thought. And the point of chapter 7, a major point in chapter 7, is that because we have died, because we have been buried with Christ, because we have our old self has been crucified with him, because our body of sin has been done away with, because of all these things, because we have stepped into a new sphere, a sphere of Christ and the sphere of grace in Christ, then we've also died to the law at the same time. And that's kind of the point of the first part of chapter 7, is that the law only has an effect on someone as long as they're alive. <laughs> Whenever there is a death, that law is no longer effective. And he uses the example of uh, a wife to her husband. If 
Uh, as long as the husband's alive, then she's bound by the law to her husband. But if her husband dies, then she is set free from that law and she's free to marry another person. The same thing has happened with us. Because we've died with Christ, death was necessary for us to then be married to another. Otherwise, we'd be adulterers. We'd be cheating on the law uh, and trying to be, while we're with, uh, trying to be with Christ. Now, we first we had to die. And when we died, our relationship with the law changed. And therefore, we were able to then join ourselves to Christ. And so now we are living in a relationship with Christ and not bound to the law. And someone, you know, teachers may not be comfortable in saying that because when people hear that, they may think, oh, I'm not bound by the law anymore. I don't have the law anymore, so I can go out and party. I can have a good time because I've, I've died to the law. The law no longer has any effect on me. I'm in Christ, so I can just live however I want. Well, for one, that violates what Paul had just said in, ver in chapter 6, that we should not continue in sin, that grace may increase. But secondly, the whole reason why we are freed from the law through our death with Jesus Christ is because of the fact that we are now living a life not according to the flesh. That's what's implied by our death with Christ, that we're no longer living according to the flesh. And he'll go even further, a step further in chapter 8 and say we are walking by the Spirit. And as we are walking according to the Spirit, the Spirit puts to death the deeds of the body and we begin to uh, to the, uh, uh, accomplish the righteous requirement of the law, he says there. And so what happens is, is that we don't, the law is not necessary for us anymore. And I know that may sound strange, but that's kind of what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy uh, in verse 8, where he says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. And actually it's verse 9 that says, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and for immoral, I'm sorry, immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. He says that's what the law is for. The law is for sinners to convict them, to show the error of their ways, so that they will come to repentance and return back to God. The law is not for a righteous person. It's not for a person who is a lawbreaker. It's for those who break the law uh, to correct their wrongdoings. It's kind of like if you had two brothers, uh, two siblings in the home. One of them's a neat freak. One of them is always keeping their clothes ironed. They always... Uh, arrange their closet according to colors and the room is always spotless and clean but then the other brother is a slob his his room is a mess everything's in disarray and disordered um it's just a messy room and he's just a, a person who just doesn't clean up after himself well which one to which one would the law of keeping your room clean apply which one needs the law of keeping your room clean the one who's keeping his room clean just purely by his nature is because he's a neat person, uh, a neat freak, we would say, uh, doesn't need the law of keeping your room clean because he keeps the room clean by nature. But the one who is who is a slob, he's the one that needs the law. He's the one that needs to be told, hey, you need to keep your room clean. And so that's the difference. And the same thing is true with a righteous person and a sinner. A righteous person who by nature is doing the, the deeds of the work of the of the law, that is, he has a circumcision uh, talked about by by Paul in chapter two, uh, a circumcision of the heart. Uh, he's been crucified with Christ. He's died with Christ. And now he's no longer walking according to the flesh. The, the law is not needed for that type of person because they're not living according to the flesh. The person who is walking according to the flesh, who is self-willed, is working against God, that's the person who needs the law because the law, the purpose of the law is to convict and to bring people to God in repentance so that they can receive the grace of Jesus Christ and therefore live a righteous life where the law is not uh, needed. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 talks about this. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 
And there in the context, he's talking about people in verse uh, 16. Uh, as a matter of fact, he says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And he goes on to talk about um, the flesh is in opposition to the spirit. But if you're walking according to the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. And if you're not fulfilling the desires of the flesh, you're not under the law because the law is not for a righteous person. And so Romans chapter 7 is showing us that, at least particularly in the first part of chapter 7, is showing us that our relationship with the law has changed now that we've died. Uh, we've been freed from the law. And to the degree that we know that our old self has been crucified, to the degree that we I consider ourselves dead to sin to the degree that we do not let sin reign in our mortal bodies to the degree that we present ourselves as those alive from the dead is the degree to which we will have freedom from the law because the more and more we live the crucified life the more and more we walk according to the spirit the less and less we need the law there to correct us to change change our outward actions and things like that because we'll just begin to do those things by nature because we're living in a, li a life crucified to the old self but living according to the new life in Christ Jesus and so um, so our our relationship again with the law has changed and so I guess what what we take away from this is that it is very necessary for us to live a crucified life and it's a very important um, thing for us to also walk according to the spirit as we'll read about in future readings and as we do that we won't need the law so much we won't need the law constantly convicting us the law constantly correcting us or redirecting us because we'll be living a life of total commitment to christ we'll be married to christ in a relationship with christ loving christ devoted to christ adoring christ worshiping christ not living for self, but wholly committed to Christ and to the kingdom. And we don't have to get caught up so much in uh, being entangled with uh, sin and the law convicting us and those things of, along those lines. So it just shows the importance of living the crucified life, of living a life with our hearts connected to Christ, walking according to the Spirit, being devoted to God. So hopefully that will be our, our encouragement as we read the first part of Romans chapter 7 today. And with that, guys, I do thank you for watching the video today. Hope you guys have a great day. Love you guys. God bless.